in the back country during the summer of 1780, Revolutionary War fighting was relentless. Whenever Redcoats or Tories were in the area, it was the job of the Patriot Militia to drive them out. For every major disaster like Waxhaws or Camden, there were dozens of partisan victories in skirmishes or smaller battles like Huck's defeat. Militiamen hiding behind trees would take deadly aim at British and Loyalist soldiers. Often British officers were targeted. This was a fight with no holds barred. August 19, 1780, three days after the Battle of Camden, another battle was fought. British provincials from 96 were camped near Edward Musgrove's grist mill on the Inneree River, many recuperating from wounds received at the Battle of Cedar Springs. It was a strategic uh, position because there was a ford here and it was easy for the British troops to get from 96 up to what is now Spartanburg. It was very important. And the Patriot militia decided that they would take it back. The Patriots included Isaac Shelby from over the mountain in what is now Tennessee, Elijah Clark with his Wilkes County, Georgia militia, and local units like the Little River Militia, commanded by James Williams, and the Second Spartan Militia, or Fair Forest Group, led by Thomas Brandon. Unfortunately, as the Patriots assembled on August 18th, they were spotted by a Tory patrol, so the element of surprise was lost. Outnumbered two to one, the Patriots sent a raiding party to the river ford to draw the enemy up to a wooded ridge where their marksmen would be waiting. To prepare the site, they chopped down trees and piled up underbrush to hide behind. They uh, set up at a, a, a ridge on the other side of the river, and they sent uh, a young man by the name of Shadrick Edmund from, from Georgia. He and his men came uh, toward the British camp and uh, kept attacking, and eventually the British decided that they better come out and fight. American soldiers in the Revolutionary War carried either a musket or a rifle. In general, regular soldiers who fought mostly in lines were issued muskets. Well, in the American Revolution, the musket was the primary uh, firearm of the day. Uh, it was uh, unlike the rifle. The musket was designed as a smoothbore weapon, uh, and its intent was to not aim at something and hit a target like a rifle, but it was for a group of men to point their muskets in a certain direction and launch a large volume of bullets in a direction, not aiming at a, at a single individual, but aiming at another army. So accuracy was not as important. The important aspect of the musket is that it could be loaded from three to five times in a minute versus two times for a rifle. So in many cases, uh, after a few rounds of musketry, a bayonet would be fixed and the other army, opposing army, would be charged with the bayonet. The weapon of choice for militiamen was the rifle. Okay, the rifle is pretty much everything the musket is not. It's a lot uh, less robust uh, weapon. It's a lot slimmer on the barrel. It fires the same way as a musket. It is very, very accurate though. The barrel is grooved, which is called rifling, the same as a modern rifle. And what it will take, a patched ball, and take that ball and spin it just like a modern bullet. Makes it have a range of some 300 yards. And you can hit just many, uh, practically anything you see. It took a full minute to load this rifle, which put it at a disadvantage in battlefield because when the British were coming at you with muskets and, and bayonets, they could, uh, they could approach your position in a whole lot less time in a minute. They could be on you with a bayonet. One thing you don't see on the, the rifle, you cannot put a bayonet on it. Okay, this is a civilian weapon. The Patriot riflemen at Musgrove Mill zeroed in on the Loyalist Provincials who were chasing Captain Inman's men up the hill. Our line extended at least 300 yards in length, waiting the enemy's approach. They advanced within 200 yards and formed a line of battle and moved on within the distance of 150 yards and began a very heavy fire. The Loyalists began firing uphill at the Americans well before they were within effective range of their muskets. I gave orders that not a man should fire until the enemy came within point-blank shot. 
not to fire to the enemy was within 80 yards distance, and that every man take his object sure. When they got close enough, the militia fired from the trees and behind rocks and all. Uh, at one point in the battle, um, there, com the commander, who was a, uh, a provincial, C Colonel Innes, was shot through the neck and fell to the ground. And the word came along the Patriot line, we've killed their commander. By that time, all of the British officers and all of the loyalist officers on this field, except one, had been killed or wounded. The British troops panicked as well as the Loyalist militia, and they turned and ran. And they, when they ran, they presented their backs to the militia, and the militia fought or shot uh, many of them when they were attempting to escape. The Patriots lacked the manpower to chase the Provincials as they headed south to 96. Also, because the news of the Continental Army's defeat at Camden had just been reported, Local militiamen wanted to stay home and protect their families. Musgrove Mill and similar encounters proved that Huck's defeat had not been a fluke. The British forces were not invincible. The result of this battle was to lift the morale of the Patriots at a time when it was sorely needed. The smaller battles and skirmishes that were fought in South Carolina redefined the way battles were being fought and the military tactics. Before they left, the three of them, Shelby, Williams, and Clark, decided that this was the way to handle the British Army. That in the future, they would not attempt to take on the British by themselves. They would keep in touch. And if one were threatened, they would all come. The British had a grand plan with the Southern Campaign, but it failed in many cases because of the stubborn resistance of the backcountry folk to the British Army of Occupation. And every partisan victory in the backcountry, whether it was Huck's defeat or Cedar Springs or Thickety Ford or Musgrove's Mill, was an advantage to the Americans because that meant that potential loyalists were going to think twice about signing up with the British. It also meant that if you're, if you're winning, people are going to join up with you. It also completely shuts down any kind of intelligence network the British might have. Freezing! 